Yeah, so when we compared the patients who had these swellings, this angioedema, and patients who never had this angioedemas, we really saw that those patients with angioedemas, they were worse. So they had a, a much stronger disease and they had a longer disease duration. So as many people who listen to this podcast might know um, that you carry is a disease that is not genetic. Hello again. This is the next episode of All Things Angioedema, your eight care podcast. I'm your host, Thomas Butgereit, and today is my pleasure to have a new guest. It's Dr. Sabino Altrichter from Linz. And as you can see here on my t-shirts, we are talking today about Uticaria. It's actually not Uticaria Day, but you may listen to this podcast when there is Uticaria Day. And we want to focus on a certain yeah, type of chronic UT carrier, which is chronic inducible UT carrier. And the reason why I invited Sabine Altrichter is that she's really an expert in this field and she will tell you more about this in this podcast. And it's my pleasure to have her here in this podcast. So I say hello, Sabine. Hi, hello, nice to meet you, nice to see you. And uh, it's really a pleasure that you invited me. Thanks. So it's, it's my pleasure. And maybe for those people who do not know Sabine Altrichter so far, maybe some words about you, Sabine, you may share what you do, what's your profession, what, what is your research interest? Yes, so I'm a physician at the Kepler University Hospital here in Linz. This is a city in Austria. We also have a special U-care and A-care center here. And I'm treating patients with all forms of urticaria and also angioedema. And I have also a very uh, special research interest in specific forms of urticaria, especially for these inducible forms of urticaria, which I always think is really fascinating because in these forms, the patients or we as physicians can really provoke the uh, symptoms in the patient. So I really think this is a very special form of disease. Definitely. That's really a special type of urticaria. And as you said already, chronic inducible UT carrier is, is a disease where patients can induce, trigger their symptoms. And the today's topic, and uh, I know you're a specialist in this, you also wrote your habilitation uh, about this topic. Maybe um, for this, Sabina, in simple words, to tell the people what is actually chronic usable UT carrier, but a special sense cholinergic UT carrier. So inducible urticaria, it also had already this word in it. So you can induce the symptoms in these patients. And typically it's a physical trigger. So something like cold or heat or scratching in the skin. But there's this special form like the cholinergic urticaria, where it's more like the heating of the whole body in the sense that if you either do exercise and you start to sweat, or if there's a passive warming, for example, if you're in the sauna and then you start to sweat, for example. So these would be the triggers for cholinergic urticaria. So this is cholinergic urticaria. And uh, as we know, urticaria is having hives, wheels, but also angioedema. Well, as you know, we are in an angioedema podcast, uh, all things angioedema. So what does actually angioedema has to do with cholinergic UT carrier? Maybe does really angioedema belong to cholinergic UT carrier? Yes, exactly. This is the fascinating thing. In many forms of inducible UT carrier, probably angioedema not so important, but especially in cholinergic UT carrier, let's say all of the, more or less all of the patients, they get this very small pinpoint sized wheel, but a fraction of patients, they also get angioedema and typically around the eyes. So they have this eyelid angioedema or some also a little bit in around the mouth, so lip edema. We had a study when I was still working a few years ago in Berlin at the Charité with more than 100 patients in cholinergic urticaria. Almost half of the patient had experienced angioedema. So, uh, so this is a substantial proportion of patients um, with this urticaria that also have angioedema. 
Wow, so many patients having really angedema. I didn't know this with cholinergic urticaria. And now I am would be curious about what are actually the differences from patients that have angedema compared to those that do not have angedema and cholinergic urticaria. Did you find something out? Yeah, so when we compared the patients who had these swellings, this angedema, and patients who never had these angedemas, we really saw that those patients with angedemas, they were worse. So they had a, a much stronger disease and they had a longer disease duration. So as many people who listen to this podcast might know, um, that you take care of a disease that is not genetic. It's coming at some time point uh, in the life and it can also go away again. But if you have an angedema in cholinergic urticaria, that means unfortunately you probably have it for a longer time. So we, we saw, um, that the patient had it stronger, uh, stronger symptoms and longer symptoms in these patients. Mm -hmm. And from a background and pathophysiology, it had been shown that it was more associated with allergies, also with other types of allergies. There's also some papers from Japan showing those patients are more likely to have asthma. So again, they are more severely affected also on the general allergy aspect. Interesting. And from when patients, maybe one additional question to angedema may ask, is it, is it life-threatening? Can this angedema be life-threatening in cholinergic urticaria? So the good thing is typically no. So as I said, the most patients have swellings um, around the eyes and some can have a bit around the lip. The lip is always getting a bit more of a concern. Um, and it had been described that those patients who have this angedema, they also tend to have a bit more of a systemic reaction. So they have dizziness or they feel a bit weaker. They have maybe a little bit of a lower blood pressure, um, but I have not experienced and there are no reports of really life-threatening reactions. Okay. So I learned there are at least two subtypes of cholinergic urticaria, those with no angedema and those that also have angedema. Are there more subtypes I need to know? Yeah, there is a big speculation going on, all different form of subtypes. Um, it's in the Japanese way of grouping the people. They have those patients with angedema in a separate group. They have like allergic type cholinergic urticaria, those with angedema, and then they have those who have a sort of a sweating problem. I kind of think that those with angioedema belong more to this allergy type group, but they are definitely the more severe end of this allergy group patients with cholinergic urticaria. Interesting. So if I were a patient, I would love to know what is actually the reason why I do have hives, wheels and angioedema when I warm up, do exercising. Can you give any explanation for this? Yeah, as I said, I think there are two main groups at the moment or the, what we know about the disease. There are two main mechanisms going on in the patients. So in this one group, what I said, allergic type, they have a higher IgE level. This is something that we typically see in patients with allergy. And in at least a subgroup of those people, it had been shown that they have IgE autoantibodies or IgE antibodies directed to also kind of skin microbiome. So the idea here is that these patients react to their own bacteria on the skin. And this is sort of an allergy to these bacteria. Uh, and then there is a second uh, pattern mechanism that had been proposed. As I said, there is this sweat type patients. So it had been shown that a subtype of patients, they actually have a little bit of a problem with sweating. So they do not sweat so well. Um, and when we looked under the microscope, we really saw that some of them had structural problems with their sweat glands. So that they had special molecules were missing or not on the right position. So that led to it that they cannot produce so well the sweat. It's not a hundred percent understood how this links to these itchy wheels that they are getting these patients. But I think these are the two different forms at the moment, as far as we understand. Okay. If a patient with suspected cholinergic urticaria comes to your office, how do you diagnose this? 
this is easy. Yeah. So the interesting thing is that the wheels look so different compared to all other forms of UTK carriers. So typically the wheels are these really itty bitty tiny wheels. They come very predictively when the patients have their special level of exertion, whatever they do, um, they are relatively fast going away. It can be horribly and it can be itchy for these patients, but typically it's not lasting longer than an hour. So this is a big difference to all other forms of uticary where the wheels are typically larger, bigger, of different sizes and so on. If there is a doubt and sometimes you do not know so well, or there can be combination forms, you can do and you should do a provocation test in this patient. To, to make them sweat in whatever form you can make them sweat. We also have a standardized protocol available, but even if you don't have that, you can just, for example, let them running down, up and down of stairs and make them sweat. And then if you see these typical wheels, you can make the diagnosis of cholinergic urticaria. Okay. And, and once this diagnosis is established, what can you offer these patients for treatment? for so, wives, yes. wheels, and maybe also for angelina? Yes, uh, since I think this angelina is, is the, let's say, showing this very strong reaction in these patients, this would not have a, a super different uh, therapy, it just would mean that maybe they need more of a stronger therapy. So step one would be antihistamines. And again, we have not really looked at that, but there's a Japanese group who had shown that unfortunately those patients with angioedema, they have a high risk that antihistamines alone are not sufficient to treat these patients. So although this would be um, a good therapy approach because we know this therapy for a long time, it works very well in some patients, it's very safe. It might not work in all patients and probably not, especially in those with the angioedema, the next step would be to try a therapy with an anti-IgE medication. And that I think can be especially helpful in this allergic type patients. Maybe not so much for those patients who have more of a sweating problem. For those with a sweating problem, there had been proposed protocols for more, let's say, of a sweat training. The patients have constant and repetitive situations where they are trained to sweat better, which had shown to improve symptoms also in these patients. All right. Maybe one question I was just thinking about, maybe a colleague comes and says, wow, how could you actually differentiate between an exercise induced anaphylaxis? reaction and cholinergic UT carrier. It's, it's somehow the same. So um, you have wheels angioedema after exercising, but on the other hand, you have cholinergic UT carrier as a chronic disease. What are some tips and tricks you Yeah, I think you really have to listen very good what the patients are telling you. Uh, and, and hopefully you have pictures, um, and, and then you get an idea if it goes more in the one and in the other direction. And if you then do a diagnostic, you can see with uh, exercise induced anaphylaxis, it's also a little bit in the world, anaphylaxis. Typically, the patients have really more severe reactions, reactions that are stronger than just skin reactions. So typically, they would have also some sort of wheezing reactions or really a circulatory problem in those patients happening also. The wheels typically in this exercise and uh, induced anaphylaxis would tend to be bigger and it would be not so predictable so that they can have exercises where they have nothing and then they have other exercise events where they have these really strong and severe reactions. So it's not this kind of constant pattern that the cholinergic urticaria patients typically have. So you said not all patients respond to antihistamines. And you also mentioned that there is a treatment, which is omalizumab, what, what is recommended according to the guidelines. What is your experience using this drug in patients with chronic urticaria? So my experience is that around two thirds of the patients who are treated with omalizumab, so this anti-IgE drug, that they respond well, that they have either really no more symptoms or at least a very good improvement of this, of the symptoms. Unfortunately, there are a few patients, let's say less than about one third of the patients where the drug is not 
as well on nothing, doing nothing really in those patients. So they are more of a problematic patient group at the moment because we do not have really good therapy options where we kind of know that they are working. Available is then more of a try and error with, with the other therapy options that we do. All right. So when you look at the horizon, what is maybe coming up soon or sooner or later, do you have some positive news maybe to share what can be expected in the future for treatment of cholinergic urticaria? Yeah, there's an ongoing trial with a, a new dra a drug, the remiprutinib, uh, that's currently conducted that had shown very, very good response in patients with chronic spontaneous urticaria. And it's currently tested for patients with chronic inducible urticaria and the cholinergic urticaria is one subgroup of this inducible urticaria. So we don't know yet. We have not seen the results yet, but this is would be something maybe then we can offer an alternative treatment for those patients who cannot be treated currently, for example, sufficiently with omalizumab. Mm -hmm. So we are looking forward to, to this drug to come, yeah, so that we can may use it in patients with cholinergic urticaria. Maybe final question. Um, it's at least in some parts, as I said, it's a mast cell mediated disease. And for the others, we are not 100% sure. So if you use a treatment which depletes mast cells, which is also currently available in clinical trials for chronic spontaneous urticaria, and I also heard of other indications of chronic urticaria, what would you expect from, from a treatment like this? Is, is there a chance also to treat these patients? What do yeah, you there think? was would already a very early, so this is now, now we are talking about a trial in a very early stage. So this was like a phase one uh, trial um, that had been done in a few patients with cholinergic urticaria where they really depleted the mast cells. They use a drug that is, let's say, killing or at least inactivating and removing the mast cells from the skin. And it had been shown that a bit more than half of the patients were really completely free of symptoms. So they were super happy, but there were remaining a few patients who also did not respond at all. I think this is a bit showing us that there really could be these two subtypes of patients, the one where IgE, the mast cell are the main driver, and then this other subgroup with maybe more of a sweat gland pathology going on, so we, we, we will see if these new drugs that are coming, I think this is the good thing about new drugs when they are coming, that we can really learn about, let's say, back to the pathophysiology of the patients. And even if that's not immediately helping them, but that is leading to the development then of other new drugs for those subtypes of patients. Definitely. So we definitely need some more research, also clinical trials on this disease and a really complex condition, one I have to say. Sabina, I think, yeah, I would have loved to spend some more time with you talking about cholinergic beauty carrier, but maybe sooner or later we will do this again when there are further new developments on this disease, especially also on angedema. So it was really nice having you for this podcast episode and people out there, if you have any questions to me, to us, to also to Sabine, do not hesitate to reach out. We are happy to answer your questions. So in this way, I wish you really a pleasant day wherever and whenever you listen to this podcast episode. Thank you, Sabine, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.